welcome to the Smart Money, Dumb Money Show. And I am your host, as usual, Keith Richards. I'm president and chief portfolio manager at Value Trend Wealth Management. And today we have a special guest. As you know, I often like to interview people in the industry and sometimes even people outside of the industry for different perspectives on the world of investing. And today, we're going to be talking to a man who I've known for quite a few years. I don't even know how many years I've known John, but his name is John Kopp. And he is a, kind of a specialist in a technique of technical analysis that I personally don't use. See, one of the things I do with smart money, dumb money, is I bring in people that are not me. You can hear all about traditional technical analysis and whatnot from me, so I don't need to bring somebody in that is just going to echo what I already talk about. So I like bringing in people like John, because John talks about something that to me is an interesting, newer way of looking at charts. Although, as John will explain, it's not that new of a way of looking at charts at all. So. John, I'm going to give him a bit of an introduction and then we'll, we'll uh, say hello. Uh, John's been uh, trading for 40 years and he was an advisor with RBC and he, he was kind of part of a team doing technical analysis at that point. And he's, uh, he's a CMT like myself, a chartered market technician. And he's also, um, like myself, showed up at the Money Show and, and uh, appeared in magazine articles and stuff. So John's got a bit of a history in the, in the industry, um, and which is how I got to know him. So John, welcome to the show and thank you for coming. Well, thank you, Keith. It's great to be here. Um, I'm just hoping that I'm not on the dumb money side of that introduction. <laughs> I promise you, John, you're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, real, really quickly, I started in the industry in the early 80s with Richards and Greenshield. So I go back quite a ways. Um, quickly realized that um, charting offered a better way of analyzing the market and stocks to me. I found that, quickly learned that fundamental mostly followed the stock higher, moving their targets up. And then when the stock went down, they eventually say, well, we can't, we don't like this. We've got to get out, which was usually at the bottom. Um, back when I first started, pre-computers, we didn't have charts on front of us like we do now. So every Monday morning, we used to get a actual physical book of charts from the previous week. So the first guy in the office got the charts. Um, so you had to get up pretty early on Mondays to get those. So I decided, well, this was even a little slow. So why don't I draw some charts by hand? So I started doing that. And that became very, a very long process going through all the charts. Back then, uh, you went through the TSE, the major, major stocks in the TSE and in the markets and that, all the different markets. And then I thought, I've got to find a better way to do this. So I came across point and figure charts. Point and figure charts, one of the advantage of point and figure charts is they don't require you to put entries in every day. They, a point and figure chart eliminates a lot of noise. So you're really only charting significant moves. So they're much faster to update. I, at the end of the day, I could update 100 charts in 10 to 15 minutes. So it really was, it was the perfect thing for me anyway. And uh, you know, as I said, there were no computers back then, so it was a great way to keep in touch with what's going on in the market. The other thing with point and figure too, or the other thing with hand charting is you'll see things that you miss when you're looking at a chart on a computer screen because you actually put the entry, you go, well, that's interesting. You know, I'm gonna make a little note and keep an eye on what that develops into. You can go through a hundred charts on a computer and miss half of the stuff that's important on that. That's yeah, exactly, John. It, I mean, I, first of all, you're talking about the red, blue, uh, red and blue books of charts. And yes. that's how I think all technical analysts, I myself as well, uh, when I was introduced to technical analysis, um, I was with Midland Wallen at the time, a now defunct company. And I, I uh, talked to the top guy there and he was into, um, charting and he introduced me to those red and blue books and I got a subscription and a red William O'Neill's book and all that stuff. Yeah. And so um, 
I just, I, I wanna ask you, um, and yes, I, I think both of us have, have both hand bombed the charts and you might know or remember uh, Dennis Mark from National Bank. He was actually with Midland Wallen during my era and which Merrill Lynch and all them. And uh, he, t he told me originally that even when you could get charts like the chart books, he would always hand bomb them because like what you just said, you got more for a feel for it. So why don't you walk us through how point and figure charts are constructed? Give us the basics. Sure, really, uh, I'm gonna switch here to... Uh... Okay, um, point and figure charts, just, just a quick view here. It's been around from, first appeared in about 1898. And at that time they were called figure charts. And figure charts were generally used by floor traders. And what they would do is on a vertical axis, they would just write a price down. So as the price went up, they would add more higher numbers, you know, 14, 16, 18, whatever. And then as the prices went down, they would do the reverse, they'd start writing them lower on this on the paper. Trouble with that is you would get gaps, so they were pretty awkward to use. Uh, in uh, 1910, Richard Wyckoff wrote a book called Figures under the name of Rollo. He never originally used his own name. Um, then in the 30s, uh, point and figure actually replaced figure charts, and point and figure are, as on the screen there, are uh, rows of um, or columns of X's and O's. Uh, X's are going up, O's are coming down. Now, simply what you see on this chart is uh, this is a CIBC chart, just happens to be, and you can see here we're in a column of X's. That means the price is going up. The four in this last box actually represents the month of April. So this box started or was entered in April. Uh, if we go back here, there's a one in January. You can see uh, December. So what happens because there's only nine months, so October, November, December are A, B, and C. You can see here this C that at that point, CIBC started to go down. So in uh, October, we were going down, reverse back up in January, and then stayed up in March. Now in April, we went back down. Now in March or April, we're starting back up. Quickly, what happens is this is do being dominated by X's right now, which means that positive is dominant. So to continue going up, we just need to go up one box. So when this stock touches, 59, 60, sorry, 58, 65, my eyes are going, we will add another X. Then we will continue as long as it keeps going up. Every time there's a box, the price goes up, we fill another box. That's dominant. Now to reverse back down into O's, we need three boxes. It's called the three box reversal method. So from this particular chart here, which is at 5806, if we went to 5636, we would reverse down, but only if there was not an X put in. So really we look at highs and lows. So the X is being dominant. If we do not have a price to add another X, we then look, do we have enough to lower it three boxes? So in this case, can we go to 5865? No. Okay, can we go to 56, 36? No, no entry on the day, move to the next chart. If we do have volatility and we hit 58, 36, or let's say we go to 60, 42 on that day, that would add four boxes, game over. Once that's in, it's being dominant. There is no chance to reverse. We've hit the dominant. So John, can I, can I yes, ask you please. a quick question? Please. So the box size in this case is what? This box is actually 1%. Oh, so you're using the percentage. I'm using a percentage. And I'll quickly touch actually on that. For most, 
most software has what's called a traditional box. Problem with traditional boxes is that you have at, at below $5, the box size is 25 cents. When it goes above $5, the box size all of a sudden will go to 50 cents. And then above $20, it goes to, to a dollar. The problem with that, and I'll show you on uh, this chart right here. You can see this chart here that down here, each box is moving. At, that's not a good, that's the right chart, sorry. There's the chart I wanted, it's traditional, yeah. You can see that down here, these boxes are moving at 25 cents for each box. Then all of a sudden up here, they start to move 50 cents each box. Mm. And then when you get above 20, they're moving a dollar each box. Very complicated to do that or to figure out what's going on. So what we've done is we've gone to percentage charts and here we've got a 1% chart. So each move has to be 1%. So if the stock goes up 1% in the day, we'll add another X. If it doesn't go up 1% a day, we'll look, okay, does it, is it down 3% on the day, which would be enough for the three point reversal. If that happened, we would reverse to O's and therefore the O would become dominant. So tomorrow, are we down 1% in the O's? No, are we up 3% on the X's? So can we reverse back from X's to O's? Does that make sense or is that just confuse you a bit? <laughs> no, that's that's good. So effectively, you know, the way the way point figure works is that we're looking for uh you don't get to add a new, unlike a bar, like a regular bar chart, where if the price today is five dollars and it goes to five dollars and ten cents well you see it the next day at five dollars and ten cents with the close being ten cents higher right in a point and figure it takes some of that noise out because it says no no you need a one percent movement on on that so if in the well i guess in in five dollar stock it wouldn't matter but if it's a hundred dollar stock and it moved up ten cents that that um wasn't one percent so um, you you take out some of the really small noise with point and figure mm -hmm. charts. Now, it, carrying it further, what I'm reading here from you, John, is that instead of using box sizes, because like you said, the problem is when the price was small, there was a 25 cent box. And then when the price went to 20 bucks, it started moving into much larger box sizes. You're using the equivalent of what we in the bar charts and candlesticks world call you know logarithmic versus just to just a straight up you know uh, charting because you're now using a percentage and of course a percentage of a hundred dollars is is a bigger price than a percentage of a one dollar stock so this makes a hundred percent sense and you're really still filtering out the noise of these small moves so I, I, am i interpreting that correctly it, that's exactly that's right that's exactly what we do and the, the reason we use point and figure charts is to get rid of all the noise which nowadays is pretty important. It's, yeah. um, and, and as it is essentially a logarithmic chart, makes much more sense when you're looking at it than the traditional. And where this really gets interesting is we're in a bit here, we'll talk about uh, objectives, targets that you use with point and figure. Point and figure is the best method really for targeting where the price is going, a minimum target of where you think the price is going. And it's it's really interesting. Over the years, I've noticed a lot of fundamental analysts, when they'll come on, they'll give a price target. And if you go to point and figure, you'll find it's exactly what the point and figure chart says. So I, th I think a lot of fundamentalists are closet technicians, quite frankly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I always said is if you're money manager isn't looking at a chart before he hits the buy or the sell button he he's either lying or he's going to go to the bottom of the ranking pretty quick yeah yeah exactly yeah. so that's the reason i use point and figure charts is they're easier to see the thing the other thing too as you can see here with a point and figure chart you either ha have it on a buy signal or a sell signal now a buy signal with point and figure is when a column of X's goes above a previous column of X's. 
So that's the, that X right there is a bias signal. That X right there is another bias signal. This O here is a cell signal. Right. Now, one of the problems with point and figure that you, you have to pay attention to is that cell signal can be a one cent move. It can be an insignificant move. So typically I'll point and figure guy, I'll go and I'll look at the bar chart and say, is that a real move? This here is an example. Um, is that really, a, it's a 1% move, but is it, how, how much of a move is it? Same as, same as a technician when you're looking at a uh, trend line. You, you say, okay, it went through by a couple cents. Is that really a break of the trend line? Now, as both Keith and I know, you do not draw trend lines with sharp pencils. You typically use a crayon because you, know, you wanna make sure the move is, is significant. Now, the other interesting thing is, is when you do go to a percentage chart too, they, they mean a lot more. If you're on a traditional chart, one penny move into that new box is, can be significant. With the percentage chart, you know it's moved 1% from the, the uh, previous um, signal or the previous. Lots of things we can do with this chart here. Um, now you can see here, we've got a cell signal, but we also know, hey, this has been up here, it's been up here. You can draw trend lines on there. You can see, you know, this, this is a buy signal from a lower level. So depending whether you're a trader or investor, you might want to, uh, you know, you still have to interpret it, but it's either on a buy signal or it's on a sell signal. So uh, just actually, John, I'll uh, interject yeah. here. Um, most of the viewers of this video are my blog readers. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the things I talk about, in fact, I've written about it in a few books that I've written and, in my trading course and whatnot uh, uh, that I've done, I, I talk about on the blog that I have a rule and the rule is it, it's sort of like what point and figure is doing to try to filter out the noise. So when we talk about a breakout, like you're, you were just looking at, so this X, we, we had a 1% move that qualified for a new X, that X went above the last X and therefore that's called a breakout according to point and figure. So I would assume like, I use a rule that says, okay, I'm going to wait for that breakout to last a minimum of three days up to three weeks. That's just, mine's a time-based rule. Okay. So it's got to mm -hmm. last a while. Um, and, and the minimum three days is according to, you know, that's a, that's a very short-term perspective. So I like to see about a week anyways. So that's a time-based factor just to make sure you don't get whipsawed on that breakout, but could you not, you're you're talking about using percentages so in order because point figures aren't as time orientated as say i am with traditional charts they're more price orientated so would you not just say well i don't want to get whipsawed by this small move one percent may sound impressive but then it could reverse you know two days later because you know the markets one percent is nothing so you could say well what if we made it three percent or something like that sure. so to avoid whipsaws is that is that a, is that a valid point hey. That, that's exactly, that is a very valid point. And let's play with this chart and show you exactly what happens there. This is a 1% chart. I'll change it to a 2% chart. Now we're in a column of X's, but we do not yet have a buy signal. You got it. Yeah. Exactly there. Or we want to get really smart. And I'm going to touch on this in a minute too on something else. We can make it even faster by going to a half, whoops, that didn't work. <laughs> that gave me a 5% signal. I was trying to get a half a percent signal. Totally different chart. So really what you're doing, you, you can speed up or slow down your chart. Uh, in, in your case, Keith, it makes a lot of sense to go maybe to a two or 3% chart just to make sure and wait for that signal to confirm which on the 2% it will do. It hasn't yet done it. So you say, okay, I'll, I'm gonna wait till it gets to 63.28 before I you know, buy or whatever your rule is there. Yeah. Yeah, totally different chart though. Let me get back to my presentation. So as you can see, we've got a buy signal there. Go ahead, Keith. I, well, I do, I do want to 
uh, poke you for because uh, two two things that you know of your notes that you sent me originally before our interview here, two things that intrigued me. Number one was was you mentioned it just recently, um, price objective, so targets. Right. So would you uh, uh, do you want to carry on and because I'm I'm interested. I think yes. you're like, well, how do we know where a stock's going? That's a really good question. People are always asking, where's it going to go? Exactly. So, exactly. So how, do you, how do you determine that? Uh, we'll go to this chart down. Okay. Um, this chart, Power Corporation. So what happened? And you, and you can see this is a one uh, percent chart, and this was a beautiful chart. If we looked at a traditional chart as Keith would do, you'd say this thing was consolidated for a long time sideways. Then all of a sudden we had a breakout of consolidation and we got a massive move there. So what happens with objectives? Um, your price bullish price objective in this case is once you've had a breakout, you wait for a correction. Then once you get the correction and then reverse back up, you count the number of boxes in the correction. So in this case, it's eight or nine, I guess, actually 10 boxes. You then add that three times that value you add to the next um, turn up X. So when it turns back up to X, you would add two, three, 10. So you'd add 30 to that, 33 and that, essentially will give you your target range, which is up here. So you can see that the objective, and I, I won't get into the mathematics as much there because it gets a little complicated, but you can see that the target on this is that this stock should go to a minimum of 47, 48, which is way up here. So that's a pretty aggressive target. Same thing with a down right here. You've got a fresh sell signal back here in whenever that was, it was in the fall then turned up, you would count those number of X's and you would add two times in a bearish to get your negative target here. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So um, that price objective of 47 and a half dollars or so. Yes. That was based on that original breakout. So we were looking at a consolidation, like, a, like yes. you said, it looks like a very traditional, you know, here's the lid, the ceiling, yep. the resistance, whatever you want to call it. And then it broke out and it broke out with conviction and it, it moved like many, many, many X's. Um, yes. And um, so how, so this is obviously being done on stockcharts.com. Yes, it is. There's yes. a program that's doing this, but what made them choose that versus using the most recent level of X's to target that $47? Like how, is, how does it decide? That it stays on that target until we get a sell signal. Okay. So if we got a sell signal here, which is we haven't had, which is a lower O, that would reverse okay. it to a bearish objective. Right. Lower low that. than that. Lower low, exactly. Okay. okay. So, right. so we will stick, that target will stay there until we get a lower low. Okay. You now see, this, this is why I have you, John, because I'm learning too. Like, you know, I, I, I know enough to be dangerous with point figure. So <laughs> well, hopefully I'm, after this, I'm, you'll won't be as dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm consciously incompetent on point figure. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go with that one here. <laughs> so so this will lead me into the next thing, which is risk reward calculations. So you say, okay, I've got that target. Now that's a minimum objective. So you are assuming that. At some point, and as Keith said, time doesn't really enter into a point and figure chart. We put time dates months on here, as I said, like the four and the three, just as a reference to when did that happen? So we can see that in December, this was up there. Um, but we're gonna assume with that 47, uh, we'll say, we'll call that 47.50 as our price objective. So say I bought that stock at, Oh, 3560, I'm going to use as an example because uh, this is updated for today and I did this over the weekend. But say I could have bought that stock today for 3560. So the difference between the price objective and what I paid is $11.90. 
So I can make, if that stock goes to a target, I have made $11.98. So what's my risk? Well, my risk is that it goes on a sell signal, which would be roughly, well, be 30, 33.60 here would be, or 33, yeah, when I did it was 33.60. So I'd put my stop at uh, 33.90. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, for my calculations, let's just say I'm using, my stop would be a double O at, um, 32.90, yeah, right around that. Yes, so I made a mistake here and I put 33 on my calculations. But essentially, I have a loss of from 35.60 to 33. Excuse me while I take out my calculator because I uh, my notes are, are wrong here. So uh, 35.60 was my cost and 32.90 is my stop. So I would lose $2.70 if I got stopped out of this stock. But my upside was 1190, which means I have a 4.4, almost four and a half percent risk advantage or re reward advantage over my risk. So my risk reward on that is 4.4 to one. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very good trade. As a trader, I want a minimum of three times upside to one one downside. Okay, good. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's actually that's so. There's a a key advantage, John, of a point yeah. figure is that it's fairly uh, it's it's well spelled out. I mean, it all comes down to, and this is the one, you know, again, here's my dangerous uh, level of point figure knowledge, but right. you know, you really have to do a good job on choosing your box size or box percentage size and right. In your preferred way of doing it and that's really going to be based on your time frame but once you've done that and you you sort of know the stock you know its volatility so you've chosen a, a reasonably appropriate box size you now have a very numerical way of doing things you say okay right. well look you know this is my target and this is my downside off you go and you just do the trade and you know you'll stay with the trade unless and, and unless that downside is is cracked and then you go okay well that's the number got to go you know, so that's a great system because it quantifies things. And I'm a big, anybody that knows me from reading my blogs and stuff, I'm, I'm a believer in quantification of stuff. I don't like opinions. I like a, a process. So this is, this is ideal. Absolutely ideal. Yeah, it, it really is. And, uh, you know, with, with using stock charts, as you can see here, they give the objectives there. I can quickly see where my stock would be so I can run through all say the TSE 60, I can go through, you know, 15, 20 minutes, look at them. Generally, I can see now in this case where if I'm buying up here and my stops down here, you know darn well that, you know, it's so far down till you hit your stop, it is not a good trade there. You really want yeah. it as tight as possible. Yes. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it's a great way to trade and, and you have to be disciplined. You put your price in there. Um, you know, and, and if you get stopped out, move to the next one. Yeah. But having at least a three to one risk reward ratio just makes you comfortable because you're going to over time, you're, you're going to, your wins are going to be much better than your losses. Excellent. Okay. Again, we're quantifying things, which makes me all happy. Um, so, <laughs> um, bullish percentage charts, you, yes. you sent me, a, in your notes, you mentioned that. So please, Bring us through that. Yeah. So what a bullish percent simply is the percentage of stocks in an index that are on a point and figure buy signal. As I said earlier, point and figure either on a buy or a sell. So a bullish percent, if half of the stocks are on a buy signal, so S&P 500, which is not 500 stocks, incidentally, but we'll assume it is 500. If 250 of them are on a buy signal, the bullish percent would be 50%. If 100 of the 500 were on, the bullish percent would be 20. It's really a good indicator. It's a breadth indicator. It's really what it's telling you. Um, if you were to do it on, um, let me ad lib here. Uh, and go, 
an index. I'll use the TSX here. Right now, the TSX, 59.5% of the stocks in the TS, TSX index are on a buy signal. Pretty neutral. You know, hangs around here a lot. You generally don't get many more than 80% of the stocks in the TSC on a buy signal at any, any one time. It's because there's a lot of junk in there. Um, and getting down here at this time to 8%, that meant everything was being, essentially everything's on a sell signal at, when you get down to 8%. Interestingly, if you look at the NASDAQ, there's a lot more garbage, believe it or not, in the NASDAQ index. So it's very common for the NASDAQ to top out in, in this 70s, mid 70 range. But this just gives you an idea of the breadth. Uh, now, if you watch BNN, you'll see David Burroughs on a lot, who's a point and figure guy. And he will talk about the uh, NYA, which is the um, essentially the New York Stock Exchange bullish percent. And that's about 3,500 stocks. Right now, interestingly, it's at 50%. So half of them are on buy, half of them are on sell. So it's a good way of measuring breadth. That's what you're really looking at. Uh, a lot of, well, okay, back to point of view. A lot of, um, a lot of times right now, it's pretty common is the market's being driven, especially in the NASA, is being driven by a handful of stocks. Not a lot of great breadth. Not everybody, every stock is participating in the run. You know, you've got your Apple, your Microsoft, the big guys, the generals are, are leading the, uh, the parade right now, the war here. Anyway, so what I've done here is I look at, in this case, I'm looking at the energy, which is fairly topical subject right now. Um, and in the S&P Energy Index, it's in a column of O's right now. It's getting worse, at, but it's down to 61% of the stocks are on a buy signal. Quite interesting when you think about that because the companies are generally doing better than the oil is, is itself. It's kind of an anomaly there. But you can see we got down here when oil went negative here, you actually got down to where only 9% of the stocks were actually on a buy signal. Uh, Bullish percent is, is kind of similar, and I'm not sure Keith may have talked to this, is, is with an RSI, people talk about below 30 is oversold, above 70 is overbought. Um, and I can remember Tom Dorsey, who I trained with, used to say that once you get below 30, everybody who wanted to sell has sold. And once you get above 70, everybody who wanted to buy has bought. The problem is, as a technician, you know that oversold and overbought can stay oversold and overbought for a long time, and they can go a lot worse than you, than, uh, you think. In fact, a, some trading technicians will look at when an index or when an indicator such as RSI goes above 70, that's actually a buy signal because you've got so much momentum in the index. Um, but you have to also look, energy is interesting is you get times when 100%, every single stock in the oil index is going up. It's in a column of X's, it's on a buy signal. And you get times when almost all of them are on sell signals. Very, very volatile sector. Can I, I'll just interject. Yep. Um, to me, John, this this seems to be using the, the uh, bullish percent um, charts or even an oscillator like RSI, you could look for extremes like, you know, the points mm -hmm. you, you just showed, uh, for example, in 2020, when almost nothing was, you know, on a buy signal. Well, that was actually the bottom of the market, right? Sure. And then when you get to these points, like end of last year, like, sorry, end of 21, I should say, where you just couldn't go wrong by, you know, every, every, uh, they, they, right. they, you know, buy and hold was the way and things like that. I mean, every stock is going up and that became an overbought point, right? So it seems to me that these charts, if they're, there's a certain level when there's too many, quote unquote, uh, too, the, the column of X's is, is too high or the column of O's is too low, that can actually be a contrarian signal. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes it is. Um, so one thing I do, 
but but that's you're you're dead on there. You really get a feel for what's going on in the individual sector, which is important. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of Canadian sector data, so you generally follow the S and P sectors to get an idea because. Usually when uh, if energy is doing good in the US, it's doing good in Canada. So one thing that I do and some of the people that follow me on Twitter will know is I will go through and I will look at all the sectors in the S&P uh, 500 sectors. So I'll go through here and there's communication is in an old column of O's. I can just quickly go through there. Real estate is in a column of X's mid range. Nothing is really oversold or overbought in this discretionary um, infotech and that. And I, I talked about there, but this is where we go back to where we talked about speeding up the charts. These are 2% charts, which are typically used in bullish percent indicators. That's kind of the de default. Um, you can see here energy just reversed back down there. Um, staples are going up, whatever. There was a couple weeks ago where everything was in X's. Then all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, everything will be in O's. Crazy volatility going in the market here now. But this is a great thing is I will also, as well as look at the 2%, I will speed the charts up to 1%, which I'll do here. And what this does is gives me a clue of what's going to be happening. So when I see all of a sudden a couple of the 1% charts, reverse direction i know hey there's a good chance the slower two percent charts are also going to change direction so that's just a way it goes back to the speeding up the charts or slowing the charts down the bullish percent you really can't go to a five percent you're just basically you don't get that much of a move in the things but this yeah. gives you a good idea and as you know if you're a trader you want to look for the sector that's good. You then want to go in and look for the best stocks to trade in that particular sector. Exactly. So, Damn. Okay. Well, actually, John, you could unshare the screen or whatever now, and we'll go back to our normal. Yeah. There, there we are. go. Okay. And there's John. So, <laughs> all right. Well, that's, that's awesome. So, you know, from what I am seeing here, uh, it's, it's what, you know, it, when you take your CMT, we both got our CMT designations, you know, you got to run through everything. You even got to learn, learn GAN, which who, who uses GAN? Anyways, <laughs> but, but you had to learn some GAN, you had to learn yep. Wave, you had to learn point figure, candlesticks, whatever, to get through the, the course. And um, one of the things that I, I've always felt is that point and figure can, can help simplify your life. And I think you've just given a pretty good case for that is that you know what i got out of this today john is that it's a probably a pretty good way because i do sector analysis just like most technical people do you know you rip through the sectors trying to look for what might be emerging and whatnot and it seems to me i think i'm going to try to uh take mm -hmm. a look at some of these pnf sector charts to see it might present a little bit easier picture for me to look at in a in a hurry uh because i'm a big believer in sector sector rotation so uh that's great i'll uh you know, I, I hope other people have got as much out of this as I did. And uh, is there anything you wanted to uh, finish up with? Yeah, I think I'll just touch. If you're, if you're sort of interested in learning more or looking for a book, probably one of the better simple books on point and figure is Tom Dorsey's, um, which is called uh, Point and Figure Charting. And you can buy any edition. They're all pretty well the same. Tom has a habit of updating his edition every two years, but adds a couple sentences so good tom's a great guy i really like tom but so if you can get an old edition even even the first or second edition cheap buy it it's a great book the only difference is tom only uses traditional box sizes he doesn't get into the percentage charts on that uh, but that's pretty good you can go to stock charts and some great tutorials on that but learn to use the percentage charts much more much much more useful i've always said about using the traditional as tom does if i sell yellow volkswagen everybody needs a yellow volkswagen so that's all that tom writes about but but that's a great book for somebody that gets really deep in the bushes uh jeremy depleche he has a book uh came out in 2005 a technical analysis but it's a reference only book i i've never no one has ever read the book cover to cover 
Um, but it's a great place to go when you got, you're stumped on something there. But stock charts is, is, and I'm not pushing necessarily other than I've used them for years. They have some great videos and tutorials on using point and figure, really good stuff. And uh, can always contact uh, me through Keith and I'll answer questions if you have anything. And, more and you mentioned you have a Twitter uh, account. So what? how do people follow you on Twitter? Um, I'm going to have to look and see what my name is. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> on Twitter, because I, I, yeah. I unfortunately go on Twitter too often and get in too many rabbit holes. And uh, I should avoid them. But um, it is uh, at cop jc so at c-o-p-p jc excellent okay and more well, than happy to answer that's, any questions. That's, that's awesome so yeah. thanks for thanks for giving us a learning <laughs> on technical <laughs> I analysis so. you I learned so. us good and uh we i mean I, I think we got a lot out of this and uh, i'm definitely inspired to definitely use it as as uh for sector rotation uh, i think that's another another tool in the toolbox so I hope everybody else got as much out of this as I did, and um, we'll we'll maybe have you on again sometime. Perfect, more than happy to. All right.